Good afternoon, everyone. I want to start with a quick warning because I believe that hackers are everywhere. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's people like this guy who are breaking into your websites, your applications, and destroying your user accounts. People like this woman who is such a good hacker that she's managed to get hold of herself a laptop in jail. People like this guy, I don't know what he's doing. Wearing sunglasses inside, I guess it's cold, he's got gloves on. But whatever it's doing, it's working because there is money pouring out of this keyboard. <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, my name's Saul Nash, uh, and I'm a developer evangelist for a company called Twilio. Uh, has anybody here heard of Twilio at all before? A couple of people, a few people. All right, cool. So for anybody who hasn't, uh, Twilio is a communications platform. Uh, it's an API for your applications to connect to your users via voice, video, or messaging using the tools, languages, or frameworks that you already know. Now, I'm not here to talk about Twilio at all today, uh, as I, uh, but it may come up as a useful thing at some point. We'll see about that. Um, in other news, please do Come and follow me on, uh, on, on, on the internet anywhere. I'm mainly called Phil Nash. And as, uh, uh, as in the introduction, I very much am after uh, beer suggestions. So thank you. Um, cool, so two-factor authentication. Um, I li I'd like to start just with a quick kind of um, definition of that uh, to get us all off the, uh, off the ground first. Uh, so two-factor authentication is a security process in which a user provides two different forms of identification in order to authenticate themselves with a the system. That has to be two different forms, and they must come from right, different categories, normally something you know and something you have. Now, a, a demonstration of this in the, real life, in the real world might well be a bank card in which you have the card. It's a physical thing that you have to use to uh, access your account, but you also need that PIN number with the card, uh, something you know, something you have. Um, you probably have seen two-factor authentication in, your, in applications that you use. Uh, who here has two-factor auth set up for like, the, the email? And uh, cool, that's, that's not everyone. So the rest of you who didn't put their hands up there, you should probably go sort that out. It's, it's kind of important. <laughs> I don't mind if you miss the rest. It's, it's cool. Um, I really, you know, sort your own security out first. I, I think that's kind of important. But um, we're going we're gonna to see why this is important for everybody else as well. And so that's what I want to go through, kind of why uh, I think two-factor authentication is important for applications right now. Uh, and I want to look at then uh, how we can implement it, how we can make this happen for our users, and then how that can be even better, and how we can improve the experience of security. So I want to start with a quick story um, about a hack. Uh, this is a guy named Matt Honan. He's a journalist. He used to write for Wired, and I don't know where he writes right now. But back in 2012, a lot of his online accounts were compromised. They were destroyed, basically, by a couple of hackers who um, didn't really do anything very technical. Um, and I want to I kind of share with you how they broke into uh, Matt's, several of Matt's accounts. So they started um, by finding his email address uh, on his website. Perfectly normal thing to do, have your email address on your personal site. Uh, it was a Gmail address. So they went to Gmail and filled in the address and found that he had a me.com uh, email backup, so with Apple. That's, that's cool, too. So with this information, they phoned up Amazon and asked to add a credit card to Matt Honan's Amazon account. It's kind of nice, I guess. Spend some of their money for them. Um, so they phoned them up, and, and they used the, the support team, uh, a bit of social engineering, in order to um, bypass as many passwords and bits of information about Matt that they could. But eventually, in order to use the account and add this credit card, uh, they had to provide two bits of information, an email address and a billing address. And getting the billing address is possibly one of the most technical parts of the hack, because they probably used something like a Whois lookup on his, on his domain name. That's about the most technical thing. Anybody can do that if they know it exists. So with those two bits of information, they added a credit card to his file and put the phone down. Then they called Amazon again. And they wanted to change the, they wanted to reset the password, reset the email address to which that reset was going to get uh, sent. Of course, they uh, had to go through all the rigmarole of, of like, not answering several security questions until finally they were asked for three bits of information, an email address, a billing address, and the last four digits of a credit card that was on file. See what they did there. So they were able to reset uh, his Amazon account's email and, and a password to that. And so they broke into his Amazon account. Top stuff. At this point, um, Matt actually was in touch with Apple support after the, uh, after the hack in order to find out what happened. So on this day at which it happened, 4.33 PM in the, in the afternoon, the hackers phoned up Apple to say, hey, 
I'd like to reset my, my Apple account, my me.com account. And after avoiding as many questions as possible, they were asked for three bits of information an email address, a billing address, and the last four digits of a credit card on file. Now, obviously not the fake one that they'd put into the Amazon account, but once they got into that Amazon account, you can go look at all the other credit cards on file and see the last four digits. So they broke the Apple account, and at 4.50 PM, that got reset. And this is where it kind of starts to speed up, because they've got most of the access they need at this point. And so at 4.52 PM, they reset the Gmail account password. At 5.01, they wiped his iPhone, at which point he probably started to figure out something was going wrong. At 5.02, they reset his Twitter password. Um, and they started to post really weird things on Twitter, kind of homophobic and um, uh, uh, racist stuff. Uh, and at 5.05, they wiped his MacBook, deleted his Google account. And then at 5.12, weirdly enough, after posting the strange things on Twitter, they then took, uh, um, took uh, uh, credit for it. Horrific, horrifying. Uh, just accounts tumbling because of, of bits of information that are quite easy to find out. And do you know why they actually went through all this trouble? Why they uh, tried to hack this? So we heard the story before. No, it's, it's purely because he had a three-letter Twitter name, Matt, and they really wanted the Twitter account. Like destroying the MacBook, the iPhone, and the Google account was simply collateral damage in this uh, weird hack that they'd gone through. But what I think is super important about this is that at any point, during this attack, uh, at the Amazon, Apple, Google, uh, a Twitter level, uh, any one of those points, although harder as it went on, two-factor authentication, having to require something that Matt himself owned would have stopped this attack. And that's one of the reasons I think two-factor authentication is super important. It does not take technical ability. It doesn't take database hacking in order to break into somebody's account. And it doesn't have to be a really good reason to break into that account either. Just going through those steps in order to post weird things on Twitter was all that was all the, the motivation necessary for these hackers. But I've got another uh, reason as well. I, you know, that's, that seems like it's maybe a, quite a lot of effort for some people, and maybe we're a bit safe from that. And you're probably also thinking, you know, I'm, I'm a sensible person, and I use uh, some kind of password manager. I use, you know, uh, and I, I use a long, different, random password for every site, and it's all kept in there and backed up and encrypted. Uh, and that may be true, um, but not everybody in the world is using these. And so I want to talk about a different hack, a hack that happened around this time last year on a rather larger scale than just Matt's uh, attack. Um, who's aware of the site Ashley Madison? Uh, yes, so uh, if you're not, it's a, we'll, we'll say, dating site. Uh, and um, it, was, it was broken uh, into for some apparently ethical reasons uh, last year. And eventually, the attackers released the entire database, um, which is cool. Uh, and uh, this included uh, all emails and usernames and things like that and, and hashed passwords, uh, except a security firm uh, grabbed this uh, dump of data and were able to uh, break 11 million of those passwords uh, because the hash hashing algorithm used on those was not strong enough to withhold uh, an attack. So what I have for you now is the top 10 passwords used on AshleyMadison.com. Has anybody got any guesses as what's number one? Pass I'm hearing password. Anybody else? One, two, three. Six ones. That's, I've not heard that one before. Um, I, <laughs> I mean, that's pretty lazy, isn't it? You don't even have to move your finger for more than one key. It's good. Um, and apparently, the users of Ashley Madison come are less lazy than that because number one is one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> That's cool, right? That's cool. Um, some are lazier though because one, two, three, four, five is in second place. <laughs> and then we get password, which you know that's good. That's good. That arrives. We got some default. I've never understood this one. No idea why that's there. Much like yes, yeah, <laughs> so many people with caps lock on. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, you know, because you need a long and random password. QWERTY. For the people, you know, who are fans of letters rather than numbers, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, this one uh, might be the most creative. A, B, C, one, two, three. You actually have to check out where those keys are and press the. Uh, um, number nine was not the characters NSFW. But I wasn't going to put what it was on a slide at a nice conference with a bunch of nice people. 
Um, so if you want to find that one out, uh, maybe ask me after a couple of beers later. Uh, and then finally, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, to round out all the numbers there. But the horrifying thing about this is that, you know, that, that's a lot of ridiculous passwords, but what it is is also a lot of people using those passwords. As 120,000 people decided that 123456 was a good password to use on a site that you really should be keeping secret from more people <laughs> um, than, than, than any normal site. It's terrifying, it's horrifying. Um, and you might even think, okay, maybe, maybe some of those were uh, you know, made up, people were just trying it, they just wanted to see what was going on in the site or whatever. But when, even when you get past number 10 there, um, and there's still like 9,000 people using a certain password, uh, and they're all kind of easy to guess, or, or probably dictionary-based ones. Um, uh, it, it's just kind of, it's awful. Uh, and um, you might think that um, the, the problem with this is that people like to reuse those passwords all over the place as well, right? One password used on many sites. And this can be an issue for regular people, but also possibly people who you know, are in charge of one of the biggest sites in the world, uh, is a developer, knows, should know what he's doing with security, and decided the password da-da-da was not only useful for his LinkedIn account, which got hacked, uh, well, LinkedIn got hacked, let all the passwords out. Uh, he then used it for Twitter and for Pinterest as well. So if, uh, if Mark Zuckerberg is reusing simple passwords around the internet, I'm pretty sure a lot of our users are as well. Um, this has happened to me as well. I, I, have to own up at this point that uh, I've, I've given this talk uh, a number of times, and after the first time, uh, and I don't think it was connected, well, let's hope not anyway, <laughs> but after the first time, I was on my way to another conference when I received a text message um, which said, here's your login for Dropbox, here's your code for Dropbox, and I was like, well, I'm walking. I, I wasn't trying to log into Dropbox, what's that all about? So I changed the password on that, but later that day, uh, lost my Spotify account. Uh, and then two days later, my Skype account, all to uh, a, a shared password uh, across those accounts. Uh, and I'd lost uh, that password and uh, email and password um, in the Adobe hack uh, from a number of years ago, but only uh, recently, only this year, did the actual data become public. Uh, so that was, that was horrifying. The weirdest thing was, I, I don't know what they were trying to do with my Spotify account, but I know that whoever took over the Skype account then went around and proposed uh, marriage to non, a number of French men over the instant messaging. <laughs> so when I managed to get back in, I did, all these kind of conversations started popping up, and there were actually conversations, like people were taking this seriously, so <laughs> I don't know what was going on there. Um, and I want to uh, uh, shout out another thing that you should do if you haven't already, uh, is that uh, you should go check out this site. That's haveibeenpwned.com. Uh, and this has all the details from any hack, any uh, like leak of user accounts um, and the passwords in it, uh, such that you can check against whether any of your usernames and passwords are available online right now. And you can also sign up for uh, alerts so that when a new, fresh set of data is picked up, uh, Have I Been Pwned will let you know if you're in that data. Uh, and if you can see just at the bottom here, they have their top 10 breaches, the, the largest uh, hacks that they have uh, access to. They don't have the Yahoo one yet, that was half a billion, but that's not quite public yet. People are probably still trying to sell that data. But you can see 359 million MySpace accounts there. Um, there is the LinkedIn hack in there, 164 million. Adobe, which got me, 152 million. It's full of people's passwords, and they, it's just, it's available. That data is out there available for anybody who wants to try and take it and use it against your site and replay it for your users. Horrible. Go check yourself out in there. So, I hope you agree that passwords are probably not enough uh, in terms of securing a user account these days. So let's talk about how we can secure uh, an account instead, and how we can use two-factor authentication. Just to do so, like this is a regular, what I hope is a regular sign-up flow for a user on anybody's site. You probably put in a username and a password, maybe that's an email address, and, um, and sign up, and then you're logged in. Maybe there's, a, uh, maybe there's a confirmation step, but this is the kind of simplest way. And then when you, um, when you come back to log in, uh, you just visit the username and password, uh, sorry, visit that login page, enter the username and password, the hashed passwords are checked against each other, and if that's all matched up, 
then in goes the user. Cool. Not safe, though, because those passwords are all over the internet right now. So let's talk about SMS. Uh, you've probably seen this if you have two-factor authentication set up on account, in which instead of um, signing in with just that email and password or registering with that email and password, you send in a, a number as well. Or maybe you set this up later. But you'd have to use a phone number. And then when you come to, register, uh, when you come to log in, uh, once the username and password is, uh, is successfully um, identified, then your user account, your number will be sent a text message. This is one of those places where you might use Twilio, as we have a, an SMS API. Um, check that out if you're interested. Uh, at this point, we can just kind of generate any random six-digit code. Well, it's normally six digits, anyway. And we can generate one of these codes uh, and then maybe save it in a column or a table in the database to check later, because you then need to, when the user receives that text message, just check against that, uh, that original code and then let them in. Um, there are some pros and cons to this approach. Uh, SMS is a pretty ubiquitous technology these days. Many, many people have mobile phones. Uh, many people around the world can receive a text message. And so being able to make this extra security layer available to almost the entire population uh, is pretty useful. However, firstly, SMS probably costs a bit of money. Um, I know it does if you send one with Twilio. Um, but that's probably not the, the worst part of it. Uh, SMS has been kind of proven a number of ways to be a little bit broken these days in terms of security. Um, so there was uh, Dere Maxson. Dere Maxson is a, one of the leading activists in the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, group. Uh, and his, uh, he lost his Twitter account. Um, he had two-factor authentication set up on it uh, via text message to the mobile phone. And the uh, attackers in this particular case simply phoned up Verizon which was um, who his phone uh, was, was on, and convinced them via some sort of social engineering, and there's no more details in the news reports, but some sort of a social engineering, to allow them to just send that number to a different phone, uh, at which point they then reset his password using SMS on Twitter and logged in, and then uh, tweeted that uh, Jerry Maxson was very much in favor of Donald Trump. He, he definitely is not. Um, but all that required was, was phoning up Verizon and, and convincing them that this particular number should point over here instead. Uh, and on a, a grander scale, um, uh, researchers have proved that you can actually uh, break down people's accounts if they're just secured by a, a, a phone number on Facebook as well. Uh, and this actually uses the uh, underlying protocol for SMS, which is known as SS7 in this particular case. Uh, and it's quite easily kind of interceptable. Um, so again, all you need to know is the number that somebody has with an account, and you can just kind of get in the way, pick their messages up. Uh, SMS is a plain text format. It's, it's not actually that difficult. <laughs> uh, there uh, was a video of the hackers talking about how, uh, of the researchers in this case, talking about how they did this. Uh, it seems to have gone from YouTube right now, um, which might be sensible. But basically, SMS is not the most safe way. It does add an extra layer of security. It does mean somebody has to go through a different process in order to try and break an account, but it's not the best. So we need to talk about um, soft tokens. Uh, and soft tokens you might have seen if you, uh, if you use an application, to uh, an app on your phone to um, authenticate with a second factor. Uh, and in this case, the sign-up flow is, is a little different, because instead of giving over your phone number, uh, you just need to the site, the application needs to generate a random secret, then a 12 or 16 digit kind of random uh, code, and then share that somehow with the user. And that's probably, if you've used one of these apps, you'll have flashed up against the QR code on screen with your, with your application, something like that. Um, once that's shared, we can confirm that it exists, uh, but the user's then logged in. And then when you, when you come back to log in again, uh, again, you, all you need to do is open the application, and you can see you have a code generated uh, in the app to log into the site. Just getting excited about it now. Um, um, so we, uh, we have to generate a secret, and then we have to uh, ind independently uh, create these codes so that they can be checked. So how does that work? And this was one of the things that really uh, led to me wanting to kind of give this talk, was actually to find out how a, a server and an application that doesn't even have to be online can agree on the same code. Uh, and it turns out it's down to a protocol, a nearly, uh, an over 30-year-old protocol named uh, HOTP. 
uh, and a kind of variant of it called TOTP. And HOTP stands for HMAC-based one-time password, and TOTP is time-based one-time password. And this is how an HOTP code is made uh, in kind of a mathematical way. So you have your secret, which is K in this case, or a key, uh, an HMAC, that, um, and then you take also a counter C. Uh, and you take the HMAC digest of both the secret and the counter. Uh, you run a, uh, an algorithm on it called truncate, which is uh, simply a, uh, it's a way of picking four bytes out of the center of the, uh, uh, of the digest uh, in a deterministic way. Uh, you can go look at the code and see how that works. I'm not going to explain the truncation algorithm right now. Uh, and then if you are using a signed uh, integer, then this is a positive bit mask, which will make it a positive number. And then finally, uh, you, take, you, know, you get that value, and then you mod it to 10 to the D. And D in this particular case will be the number of digits you want in that code. So 10 to the 6 is normal. That's all it is. Um, it's, it's actually kind of simple. And then when you could take on TOTP, Instead of uh, maintaining a counter on both the client and the server and incrementing it every time you check, uh, TOTP actually uses the time uh, to work this out. This is probably what you've seen if you've used applications to do this. Um, what it does is instead of, yeah, instead of you looking after the counter yourself, uh, the counter is made up out of the number of periods uh, of, set of time that have happened uh, since the Unix epoch. And in order to give people time in which to uh, enter these codes, that period tends to be about 30 seconds. So the counter just is 30, the number of 30 second periods since the Unix epoch. Fairly, fairly straightforward, I hope. In fact, actually, I want to I want to show you a quick uh, demo of how this works uh, because there's been a uh, uh, there's a node library that I like to use to demonstrate this because uh, it does it just very simply. And um, uh, so I'm just going to open a quick node REPL and uh, get NOTP. Uh, require that in. Uh, and as you can see, we have two functions with that, uh, HOTP and TOTP, uh, which have gen and verify functions. So let's grab that one and generate ourselves a code. Uh, I'm going to use a bad secret uh, because I'm not typing out random things right now. Uh, but what you can see is we generated ourselves a six-digit code. Nice. And if you change the counter, or if you do it the same, it's always going to be the same. Uh, if you change the counter, it's completely different. And without the secret, you can't tell uh, how you'd make that difference. Uh, and then finally, we can verify these. You can still read that behind me. Uh, we can verify these. So if we take the first one, A25147, uh, we still need the secret, and we need the counter, at which that was made as well. Uh, and we get a delta of 0. Uh, and if you were to get it completely wrong, uh, like if that was a six, uh, we get null for false. Like that's it. Um, HTTP. But as I said, like HTTP is difficult because you have to look after that counter yourself. So if we take TOTP instead, uh, then all we need to generate a TOTP function uh, is the secret, um, and that is going to stay that for however long this thirty-second period takes. So I've got it at the start of the period apparently right now. Cool. Uh, OK, so if I go on to write the verify function for this, uh, by the time I'm finished writing it, it should be uh, wrong, which is good to, good to know. Uh, I've got the secret in there. Uh, but it's not entirely wrong. In fact, this is a delta of minus 1, so it's one off. Uh, and if we generate it again, we can see we've got a new one. And if I get that code in quickly, 5, 4, 3, 2, 2, 4, 3, and we have a delta of 0, so that's spot on. Uh, and this allows us to do a, uh, a window of uh, time so that uh, users don't have to hurry. You know, if you've seen that in the application, the time's ticking down, you're typing it into the login form. Um, if, if, it's been, uh, if it's been created, if it's been written correctly, we'll have this delta, and you can have a sliding window of time in which to uh, adjust. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's pretty useful. So even if you're just a user, um, don't rush. Don't rush your logging in. Uh, it shouldn't worry you if it ticks over to the next code. You can still use the last one. Um, cool. And again, it's going to update again. And now my delta for that will be minus 1, and my delta for the original one will be minus 2. Lovely. And that's the uh, library uh, on GitHub. I recommend uh, going and checking it out, because it does have a very clear implementation of the HOTP algorithm. So if you are interested in the code of how this works, uh, and it's JavaScript, and that's maybe not everybody's cup of tea, 
but uh, it's very readable, uh, it's very understandable, so I recommend taking a look at it. So we have to share these secrets. And as I said earlier, this is probably via a QR code, right? And so this, if you're making this up, this is the kind of thing you have to do uh, in order to share it. You make a URL to share, the QR, share as a QR code. And so the URL requires uh, a protocol, OTP auth, uh, a type, which will then be HO or TOTP, uh, the label, which will be what your, uh, what your thing comes up in in the authentication application. So this label probably is both your application name and also an identifier for the user within the application in case they have multiple accounts that they want to all secure with the same app. Uh, and then finally, you add some parameters, and that includes the secret, which needs to be base32 encoded, and probably another label, uh, which just describes the application. And so this might be a little small, but that's, a, that's an example there of my creatively named example app. So we see we have OTP off, it's TOTP. Uh, it's called example, and it, uh, this is my account on that particular example. And then we have our secret, and the issuer uh, is, is going to be the label name as well. And so I made one of these earlier, because I like QR codes. Has anybody got an authenticating app with them right now and can scan that on screen? Uh, because I reckon we can use the, uh, the NOTP library there to, to get the right code. Uh, if I just grab my app up, I have that too. Uh, so I'm seeing the code. I'm currently seeing 323342. Has anybody scanned it and agree with me? You've got f seven seconds to agree with me, apparently. All right. Yeah, so you've got 323342. Cool, because it's about to change. There we go. And so actually, uh, so this actually is using um, uh, hello as well as the secret. Uh, and so uh, 472714. Are you seeing that as well? You are seeing that as well. Cool. So that's my uh, QR code secret there. Uh, and that, that totally works, which I'm quite excited about. It's the first time I've done that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And it might be the only reason there, is a, there are QR codes in the world, and this is my favorite Tumblr of all time, uh, no posts uh, for the first uh, four and a half years of its life. Um, <laughs> QR codes can keep us safe, and that's cool. And actually, uh, one of the cons of using this entire thing is actually if you were to see a person scanning this QR code in public, you would just scan it as well. That's, you've got their token, and you can log in as them if you can find their password out as well. So uh, that's kind of one of those cons against this. Um, the other one being that you need to have a smartphone. You need to have a device which can run one of these applications, uh, which, of course, not everybody does. If you were in the um, last talk, then you'll know that Anastasia does not have uh, a smartphone anymore. She only uses a, a feature phone, uh, and that's totally cool. If you were in that last talk and you were planning a digital detox, you don't have to yet. Feel free to tweet about all this or follow me. <laughs> it's cool. Start it after the conference. It's fine. Um, the pros, on the other hand, of course, that you can generate these codes offline. Um, the first time I gave this talk, I was checking something out in my Twilio account whilst going through my slides, uh, and I had to log in. Uh, and we were only using SMS at the time, and I was in a basement. And I had to go upstairs, and it was very annoying to me. So I was like, this is a, you can, be un you can just be out of range of your own uh, account details, which is annoying. So you can be offline, which is brilliant. Um, and that's, I think that really is the, the thing. Like we don't have, there's no other attack vector uh, on this aside from maybe you giving away your QR code uh, when, you, when you log in in the first place. It's a really, it's a really awesome thing. On the other hand, like, in, in terms of cons, it's actually still not a great experience. Uh, in both our SMS and our token cases, we still have to, as a user, pick up our phone, open an app, open our SMS or our, or our authentication app, uh, and copy digits across to a form somewhere else, which is really kind of annoying. So I, I, I want it to be better than this, and I believe it can be better than this. Um, and I've been told many times over, the, over my course of, a, of life as a developer that friends don't let friends write their own authentication frameworks. Uh, and this is, so I've, I'm a Rails developer uh, a lot of the time, and we have a library called Devise, which, which does all kind of authentication, um, handles all the things that people who aren't necessarily like security professionals don't need to know, don't know uh, all of those things. So it does the hashing of passwords right. It, it does everything else right. Uh, if you live in, uh, in the Node.js world, then Passport, I believe, is, is the example. Uh, I don't know where else, um, uh, what else you've been working with, but those are my kind of go-to things. Um, and I believe that we probably should uh, make that the same for two-factor authentication frameworks as well. Like There are good ways to break these things. Uh, with the soft token, you have to keep those secrets for the, your user 
and you have to keep them in plain text or at least a, a, a decryptable manner because you need to always use the original secret in order to generate the, um, the, the, the code. Uh, and so I just want to introduce you quickly to a company called Authy. And Authy are part of Twilio. They've been part of Twilio for nearly uh, two years now. Uh, and they provide two-factor authentication as a service. It's basically three API calls in order to perform all of this two-factor authentication. Uh, and so the user registration flow in this case uses the user's phone number uh, to sign them up. Uh, and, and you just pass that off to Authy to register them. as That's API request number one. And you receive back an Authy ID. That's an ID that you can keep in your database. Uh, if it gets out, then um, uh, attackers can't do anything with it. Uh, and then um, when you come to log in, uh, and you've got the username and password right, uh, you send a second API request to Authy to say, hey, let's verify this user. And that prompts either an SMS if the user hasn't installed the application, or Authy has an Android and iOS application as well. And it will prompt a, a notification to that to say, hey, someone's trying to log into your account. Uh, and then you open up the app, and you do the copying across of the number. Uh, and um, at that point, you can do your third API request, which uh, verifies that that number was correct. So you just pass the ID and the token that they just put in. So it's really quite simple. Uh, and, and saves you having to do a lot of the security stuff yourself. But it goes beyond that. Uh, and I kind of want to talk a bit about the, the, the future of this. Because as I've said, the user experience of this copying numbers across is, is really quite dull. And we accept it some of the time because we believe security is important. But if we can remove that layer as well, if we can make it a bit easier, then I think uh, we can make our users happier as well. And so I said uh, that the Authy app actually sends push notifications uh, if you're trying to uh, log in with an Authy-powered um, uh, two-factor authentication flow, it will push notifications to the app. But that, uh, you know, that still just opened up a code. We can do even better than that um, using those push notifications. And I want to show you a quick demo, a quick video of that right now. Um, so this is a, a bank we made up called Owl Bank for pretty much no good reason. Uh, and when you go to log in in this account, in this bank, it's powered by what we call Authy OneTouch. And so it sends the push notification. Uh, and, and that arrives on your phone. But instead of pre presenting you with a code, it's just going to say, hey, this bank's trying to log in. Is that OK? And you can approve or deny that at this point. Uh, and it has, uh, and when you approve, uh, it sends a push notification, sorry, it sends a webhook back to the original application to say, hey, this user said yes. And the application can then move the user on themselves. I just want to roll that back just to this point. Um, to show you a couple of extra features. Uh, firstly, uh, over here, you can see there's a bunch of information that you can send uh, down to the application to say, hey, you know, not only is this person trying to log in, this is the device they're on, um, th this is the date and the time that we expect this to be happening. Uh, and if the user is not using this application at the time, you can fall back to the token uh, or indeed send them an SMS uh, as well, just to, uh, just to make sure that all the ways they can possibly log into their account are available. Um, and this, uh, this banking application actually uh, shows, off, um, uh, shows this off in a different way as well, because it actually does the same for when you do a transaction. If you send people money, uh, we can also push one of these authentication messages. And uh, at that point, you can put the transaction value uh, into the thing and say, are you sure you want to be sending uh, £20,000, $20,000 to this person? Is that what you wanted? And you can approve or deny at that point. But nowhere do you have to copy a number across. All you have to do is say yes or no. And I think that's, uh, that's just a much nicer, much smoother user experience and something that we could all aspire to in our, in our kind of security. This has pros and cons. It still requires the internet again in this case. So um, uh, you know, if you are underground, if you're uh, in a tunnel, if you're in another country and you don't have data, then this isn't going to work. However, it does fall back. It falls back to that token-based generation and eventually will fall back to SMS if that's, uh, if that's what you need. Um, obviously, this one also, like the SMS version, costs money because it's a company that's offering it. Um, and your users do need to have that application installed. Um, but you can prompt them to do that however you like. So in summary, um, users are bad with passwords. I'm bad with passwords a lot of the time. I kind of only just started with a password manager myself. Uh, and so people like to use the same password around the, around the web. We know that. And the problem with that is that other, other websites are bad with passwords. Even the best websites in the world, the top ones with thousands of developers working on them, places like uh, MySpace, like Yahoo, like LinkedIn, are just handing passwords out at the end of the day. 
And that's terrifying. So we need to protect our users on our applications from those other applications which are losing stuff. Two-factor authentication can use this push notifications uh, and, and this kind of one-touch method which stops uh, people having to copy numbers across, or there's token-based or SMS. And I like to think of this in kind of a, a front-end uh, way and the kind of idea that you can gracefully degrade down to the uh, kind of lowest uh, class of, of authentication from the best experience uh, down to the worst. So in reality, two-factor authentication is, is for your users. It keeps them safe, and hopefully we can keep them happy with the experience as well. And keep them safe from people like this guy, who I'm guessing has just like nicked that from the URL bar or something. <sighs> so that is it. Thank you very much for listening to me this afternoon.